Good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Druin, manager of the Missouri Valley Special Collections, the library's local history department and archives. Thank you for joining us for another online installment of our signature Sunday series. We look forward to the day when we can once again hold events inside our auditorium, but until that time, we will continue to offer a variety of online programming. If you missed uh, one of our recent events, you'll find them archived on the library's website and YouTube channel. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jerry Insler, who joins us from his home in East Dubuque, Illinois. He is here to discuss his new book, Jim Bridger, Trailblazer of the American West, published uh, last month by the University of Oklahoma Press. Bridger was indeed a trailblazer. He was the first mountain man to come upon the Great Salt Lake in Utah, paddle the Bighorn River's Bad Pass, and explore the wonders of Yellowstone. He operated a trading post on the Oregon Trail and was also a pioneering merchant in Westport when it was a frontier outpost. In his new biography, Insler examines Bridger's remarkable life, from early explorer, guide, trapper, and trader, to his retirement to a farm near Watts Mill outside of Kansas City. Insler was the founding director of the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, a Smithsonian, a Smithsonian affiliated institution in Dubuque, Iowa. He retired in 2016 after nearly four decades heading up the museum. Over that time, he has written and curated numerous national exhibitions and films, published historical articles, and given presentations throughout the U.S. and abroad. Jerry, thank you for being here today. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And I thank all of our listeners and watchers. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about Jim Bridger, and I've been excited about Jim Bridger for many, many years now. Um, and some of you uh, do know about Jim Bridger and some of you maybe don't know as much as you would like to. And that's the opportunity that we have now. Um, how did I get involved with this? Years ago, I watched the movie Jeremiah Johnson. It was on television. I didn't see it in the big screen. And I just was captivated by that tremendous story. Uh, Robert Redford played uh, um, one of the uh, main characters there. And so the next morning I was so thrilled with this whole concept of, of the mountain men and the fur traders and the explorers. I went to a local library, a very small library, and couldn't find much about Bridger, although I found him usually on the first or second page of about 30 different books. They were listing him as, as one of the most significant frontiersmen in American history. Um, so that really piqued my curiosity. And so then I started traveling. I drove to Memphis. I was about 60 miles away and I, I found uh, books that had been written about them. But I also found that those books, uh, one of them was uh, 1946, 75 years ago now. And one of them was 1962, 59 years ago. They were incomplete as would be expected because they don't have the advantage of all the, uh, the historical sources, the articles, the books that have been written, uh, and then all the new archival materials which have come forth. Um, so if you don't know a lot about Bridger, you are just like I was when I started this quest. I didn't know who he was and what he did. But as I, as I started working on it, I just became captivated right from the very beginning. Um, and so I want to read to you right from the very beginning, uh, just a short segment just so you get a sense of what the style and pace of the book is. So this is uh, chapter one, uh, page one, uh, to find a home. Jim Bridger left home for the West when he was eight years old. He had helped his parents keep a farm and an inn near Richmond, Virginia. Now he and his family were traveling nearly a thousand miles looking for a new life in Illinois territory. It was the Western edge of the American settlements. For Bridger, a brown-haired lad whose eyes were liquid hazel, bright almost to blackness, the move would change his life forever. By day, they followed dusty roads and rain-swollen streams. By night, they sought shelter and talked of dangers ahead. The year was 1812, which was a dangerous time for a family to travel. The United States was 36 years old, and it was at war with British, the British for the second time. And as the, the Bridgers moved west, the War of 1812 moved west with them. The Bridgers finally reached their new home in Illinois and settled at a place called the American Bottom, 
near the Mississippi River right across from St. Louis. If Bridger's adult life is any indication, as a youngster, he was likely gregarious, enthusiastic, and resourceful, which is totally contrary to all previous biographies about Jim Bridger. Three tragedies did interrupt Bridger's childhood in rapid succession. When he was 12, his mother died. Uh, his brother died the same year. And then the next year when he was 13, his father died. Bridger and his sister were orphans. He got a job working on a ferry boat to help uh, travelers cross the Mississippi River at the St. Louis region. And then he started working for a man named Philip Kramer. Early, early biographies have said that Bridger was apprenticed to a St. Louis blacksmith of little renown. And that's not true at all. Uh, he apprenticed to Philip Kramer, who was the most noteworthy gunsmith uh, for hundreds of miles. And he lived in Illinois, not in Missouri. Uh, and Bridger was 12 and 13 when he started working as an apprentice to Philip Kramer, who was one of the most noted gunsmiths in the Midwest of the country. And one of his first assignments was to go up the, uh, the Illinois River to a place called Peoria, which is, in, is an Indian name. And he was working under Kramer, but trying to help provide goods uh, and repair guns for the Potawatomis. And the Potawatomis uh, were not nearly as in a, a good a position as they were in the War of 1812 when they were siding with the British. When Bridger was 17, there was an ad that was put in the uh, Missouri Republican and several other newspapers. And the ad was, uh, was asking for 100 enterprising young men to go up the Missouri to be there to be employed for one, two, or three years uh, to be trapping beaver. Bridger was 17 years old and he signed up for that expedition. Why did he sign up for such an adventure? Was it to escape civilization and the expectations? Was it to make his fortune? Or was it to take the measure of the new land and make it his home? Bridger went up the Missouri River with Andrew Henry. Andrew Henry was on the land party and Mike Fink was on the boat party. He was the king of the keelboat men at that time. And Bridger was one of the men who stood on the narrow catwalks on either side of the boat, long poles in hand to use their human muscle to move the boats upstream. Fink atop the cargo would shout, set poles for the mountains. And they sank their poles into the river until they hit the oozy bottom. The other end of the poles rested snug against their shoulders. Then Fink would bellow, down on her now, down on her. And they lowered their bodies and pushed against, pushed against the poles, which actually moved the boat forward. So that's how Bridger got his start. Um, he's, he's really an amazing person in terms of all the areas of the West or the eras in the West that he was part of. Um, he began his journey, if you will, when, when he was eight years old and he um, was very, very, very active until he was 68 years old. So you have six decades of activity. So how do you put a, uh, how do you summarize six decades of activity? In about 80 words, I can give you a very quick snapshot just by looking at the table of contents. To find a home, keelboating upriver, the bloody Missouri, Mike Fink and Hugh Glass, Bridger discovers Great Salt Lake, Bridger braves Bad Pass, pilot for the brigades, partner in the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, Eagle Ribs and the Blackfeet, the race to rendezvous, Bridger's family, so that's, those are the first 11 chapters, and it represents the first 13 years of Bridger's time out in the Rocky Mountains. The Siege, Night of the Rockies, 17 years without tasting bread, Fort Bridger, the Oregon Trail, Cayotera and the Gulf of California, Old Bridger is death on us. That's a quote. Uh, it's what um, Brigham Young said, um, Jim Bridger and his partner, Louis Vasquez, uh, sent a letter to Brigham Young, who had just established 
uh, the uh, Church of the Latter-day Saints location in Salt Lake City. Um, and with that warning, um, Brigham Young said, I believe old Bridger is death on us. And if he knew that, uh, that hundreds and hundreds of Indians were coming to slaughter us, he would probably kill a man who tried to warn us. Um, so there was conflict there. Um, continuing in, in the 80 words here, Marianne Chapetta, Virginia, and Mary Josephine, that's a wife and three of his children. Gold Rush and the Map Makers, Bridger Pass, Horse Creek Treaty, the Mormons take Fort Bridger, Guiding Gore, G.K. Warren, and Ferdinand Hayden, Chief Guide for the Utah War, The Search for Yellowstone, America's Guide and Storyteller, Blazing the Bridger Trail, The Powder River Campaign, Red Cloud Fights Back, the Battle of the Hundred in the Hand, the Crows would not permit Bridger to be endangered, and so much farther. That's a wide variety of experiences and encounters, and the book follows uh, Bridger as he, uh, as he went through his life and tried to first be a fur trapper and then be a fur trader and leader, uh, and then being a fort owner and then being a scout and a guide, um, trying to be helpful to as many people as he could, and in many cases trying to prevent uh, any kind of uh, warfare with some of the indigenous peoples. So, so that the first point that I'm making then is Bridger is a fascinating figure who actively participated in six decades of Western history. The second point is that Jim Bridger is someone you would want to meet. Uh, in fact, people of his day, they often remembered when it was that they first met Bridger and they described him and they told about, uh, you know, what they thought of him, what they had heard of him and what he said to them and they said to him. Uh, he was a very noted celebrity. Students in school uh, were well aware of Fort Bridger was in their school books in the 1840s. Uh, and then when sometimes when they came out for the 1849, 1850 gold rush, uh, they said, oh, this is the fort we read about in our history books or our geography books. I'm going to turn on to go to some slides here uh, and show you some of the uh, images. I'm going to go to uh, and get that here in just a minute here. Okay, so you should be seeing uh, the uh, images. Uh, and this particular image is preparing for a buffalo hunt. Uh, the, the painting is by Alfred Jacob Miller, who came west in 1837. Um, and the next image is not moving for me. Let's see, there we go. The next image is uh, hunting elk. And so they were not only trapping beaver, but they were actually, uh, you know, surviving by uh, hunting buffalo and hunting elk. So I want to get to uh, a description, um, somebody who wrote about Bridger. This one happens to be Washington Irving, who was a uh, well-noted uh, writer at the time. And I'm going to read a little bit about what he said in his book here. And this is, uh, Washington Irving was describing uh, a number of people in the 1820s and 1830s. Um, this band, which included Bridger, Irving said, this is a, a totally different class has now sprung up. The mountaineers, the traders and trappers that scale the vast mountain chains and move from place to place on horseback, heedless of hardship, daring of danger, prodigal of the present and thoughtless of the future. There is perhaps no class of men on the face of the earth who lead a life of more continued exertion, peril, and excitement. That's from uh, Washington Irving writing about these mountaineers as they called themselves. This one is called Bull Boats. Uh, and uh, this is also Alfred Jacob Miller. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a way of getting across a river or taking goods or people downstream. Uh, if you don't have a boat and the river is too high, uh, then you just uh, you'd use buffalo hides and uh, willows and other sticks and you create your own uh, your own floating boat. Um, and uh, this was a, a common scene and very common for Bridger. Bridger was somewhat of a boatman. He, there are many instances where he made these bull boats 
to help the, uh, the scientists from the Smithsonian, to help the uh, commanders of the topographical engineers who are trying to map the West. Uh, Bridger knew exactly how to make these and he made them all the time. This is something called Devil's Gate and it's near South Pass on the way to cross over from the American side to what was the uh, Spanish side and what was French side. Um, and then it was uh, claimed by Britain, claimed by Mexico. This kind of a pass was, was common, uh, uh, kind of a dangerous pass. There were two other instances where Bridger went through something like this. Bridger, Bridger went through this, he didn't discover it by any means. But on his way down the Bear River, following the Bear River, uh, on his way to finding the Great Salt Lake, he went through uh, the Bear River Canyon, which is considerably longer than this one. And he was 20 years old when he was the first of these European explorers to understand that this is a lake which has an enormous amount of salt in it. People had seen this lake from a distance, the Americans, Euro-Americans, but they did not know that it was uh, full of so, so uh, filled with salt. Um, so that, that was when he was 20. When he was 21, he ran through a, a, a pass much more dramatic than this. Um, it was it's called the, the Bad Pass on the Bighorn River. And uh, Ashley had about 25,000, William Ashley, his boss, had about $25,000, maybe $50,000 worth of, fur, of furs that, that had been trapped. This is now 1825, Bridger is 21 years old. Um, Ashley asked for a volunteer and Bridger said, I'll volunteer and he made a raft and he went through this uh, tremendously harrowing experience through the Bad Pass Rapids. Uh, the crow uh, believed or said anyway, that there was a Manitou, a great evil spirit who lived in that Bad Pass and would destroy any boat or any person who tried to go through. Well, Bridger went through and he did report to Ashley that it was not safe uh, for them to try and make, move their goods through the, that pass, the bad pass. Uh, so this is when Bridger is now just 21. So early on, he showed tremendous uh, initiative, you know, um, working on a, on a flat boat shortly after his parents died, um, apprenticing and living among the Potawatomi Indians when he was 12 and 13, uh, signing up at age 17 to go west, um, at age 20, uh, being one of the first to, or being the first known to identify Salt Lake as a lake of salt. Now at age 21, he's volunteering to go through the Bad Pass. Um, th by this time, they had crossed South Pass and they were actually uh, over in the area of the Shoshone and the Crow and the Nez Perce and the Flatheads. In this particular image, also by Alfred Jacob Miller, it was drawn, uh, sketched in 1837, painted later, uh, but it shows the kind of activity that Bridger and others would have, would have uh, noticed. This is called Indian hospitality. So the, the man in blue has a long pipe. They are smoking the pipe, uh, which is often uh, what you would do first before you would start trading. There are, uh, there are two men, two Shoshone men, two Shoshone women, and a, and a Shoshone infant. And so there was a lot of, um, a lot of camaraderie. There was intermarriage. Uh, there's another image here called the Thirsty Trapper. So you have a couple of trappers, one in blue and one in green, in red rather, and they're stopping and there is a, a, a Shoshone woman who is providing uh, water out of a shell uh, so that they could uh, you know, satisfy their thirst. So it was very common for many of the um, American Europeans to intermarry. And, and just talking a little bit about who these people were, you know, Bridger was from Virginia. Many of them were from Kentucky, some were from New York, uh, but some, uh, some were Dutch, some were French Canadians, uh, some were Mexicans. They also had with them traveling in these bands of groups of, of, of uh, trappers called brigades. Uh, they had with them Delaware Indians and Iroquois Indians from the east. And then also going along with them uh, in their journeys were Shoshones, uh, both the male and female and children. Some of them were intermarried. Uh, so you might have a, a, uh, 
an American trapper, uh, a Native American Indian, and mixed race children. Uh, so the Shoshone and the Crow and the Flathead and the Nez Perce and several others, they would often travel with them. Most of uh, Bridger's relationships with the indigenous peoples were peaceful. Uh, this is an image of eagle ribs, and it's a painting from 1832 by George Catlin. And this was not a good uh, relationship for Bridger. Um, eagle ribs was a, a of the blood band of the Blackfeet Indians. And he, in 1832, he uh, uh, attacked a group of trappers who were actually competing with Bridger. Um, and uh, they were able to, under Eagle Ribs leadership, they killed Henry Vanderberg and I believe it was six others of their group. Then Eagle Ribs comes over to the Gallatin River. This one, earlier one was on the Madison River. Now on the Gallatin River, uh, one of the three forks of the Missouri. Uh, and there's a disturbance as, you know, Eagle Ribs and his, and his warriors are on one side and Bridger and, and his men are on the other. And Bridger rides forward with the idea of making peace. Um, he hears a sound or th there's an occurrence actually, someone was, uh, actually it was a Blackfeet woman who saw her brother and she had been with, the, with Bridger and the trappers and she raced across to the Blackfeet and that caused such a commotion, everyone was up in arms. Bridger cocked his rifle. At that incident, um, Eagle Ribs, who was wearing eight uh, white scalps attached to his uh, formal costume anyway, um, wrenched the, the gun out of Bridger's hands and, and hit him on the head so badly that uh, he almost blacked out. And then Bridger took two arrows in the back. Um, and they were able to pull one of those arrows out with a lot of tremendous exertion. The other one stayed in his back for three years, almost three years. And it wasn't removed until 1835 when Marcus Whitman came west. He was a doctor, but he came west as a, as a missionary to establish missions in Oregon territory. Um, so, so this is a very interesting character, and this is from the Smithsonian Institution, this image by Catlin of Eagle Ribs. This is an image of Fort Laramie in 1837. Fort Laramie was founded in 1834 by William Sublette, and William Sublette had been Jim Bridger's boss, and then Sublette and his partners sold out to Fitzpatrick and Bridger and three other partners uh, this company that was known as the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. So Sublette owned it in 1834. In 1835, Bridger and Fitzpatrick and several other partners owned this fort called Fort Laramie now. At the time, it was called Fort William on the Laramie River. Let's go inside the fort. This is a view from the inside. This again is, is, uh, is William Drummond Stewart's depiction of uh, what he saw in 1837. Um, and so, and as you know, Fort Laramie is, uh, is iconic in American history West. This is a scene from Rendezvous. Rendezvous uh, was a way to supply the trappers and traders who basically lived their whole life out on the, uh, in the Rocky Mountains. Jim Bridger went 17 years without coming back to the States. He left when he was 18 years old and went 3,000 miles uh, by boat and by horse and by foot. Um, and he didn't come back for 18 years. And he rarely slept in a, uh, in a fixed place. Uh, during the summer, he was often sleeping under the stars. They would, they would be in an Indian lodge, maybe. Uh, they would, maybe for winter, they would build a temporary cabin. But Bridger had no permanent home at this time. But he was considered the king of the mountain men by this time. Uh, he was so knowledgeable about where the beaver furs were, how to treat well with the various tribes. Um, most of the, uh, the indigenous people or Indians that are depicted here are Shoshone. So if you look on the, on the left, there's two white horses on the left, and then there's a, a man in a dark horse with a red plume. I'm going to give you a close-up of that image. It's a little bit blurry because it is a close-up. But that is a painting of Jim Bridger wearing uh, a portion of a suit of armor. This armor was given to Jim Bridger by Sir William Drummond Stewart. And Sir William Drummond Stewart was a friend of Jim Bridger's. 
and he came over first in 1833. He hired Miller to start painting these paintings in 1837. And at this 1837 uh, rendezvous, he had a very special present for uh, Jim Bridger because Jim, Jim Bridger was considered to be the leader of these mountaineers. And the way many people in Europe viewed these mountaineers is if they were, uh, they were like King Arthur of the round court or they were uh, the round table. They were knights of great valor. Um, there was tremendous enthusiasm for the leather stocking tales written by James Fenimore Cooper. Well, these were the actual, not the fictitious um, uh, people who, as Ver Irving said, these mountaineers who roamed through the, through the West. I just want to read you a, a little bit about uh, what, we're, what we're seeing here. There was a man named David Brown who was at this rendezvous. Let's see if I can go back. It's a little bit easier to look at that one. So David Brown writes this in 1837. He was there and he saw Captain Stewart. On the right of Captain Stewart sat, or rather squatted in Oriental fashion, one of the most remarkable men of this remarkable assemblage. This was Jim Bridger, the leader of the beaver hunting parties. He had a thorough acquaintance with the whole mountain region from the Russian settlements to the Californias and every nook by hidden lake and unfrequented stream. Bridger had a complete and absolute understanding of the Indian character based on his own large experience. To sum it up, his bravery was unquestionable, his horsemanship equally so, and as to his skill with his rifle, he has been known to kill 20 buffaloes by the same number of consecutive shots. So he was a, a very distinctive person. And as I said, people wrote about them almost always when they saw him. And they described him as tall, six feet at least, muscular without an ounce of superfluous flesh. He might have served as a model for a sculptor or painter. His cheekbones were high, his nose hooked or aquiline, the expression of, of his eye mild and thoughtful and the expression of his face grave, almost to solemnity. This is, a, this is an image of Fort Bridger that Jim Bridger established with Louis Vasquez. Well, he, actually in 1841, he established Fort Bridger with Henry Frabe. Uh, Frabe died uh, that year. And uh, so Bridger took on a new partner, Louis Vasquez. In 1842, they built the second Fort Bridger. In 1843, they built this, which is the third Fort Bridger on the Oregon and California Trail. And this is from a painting by William uh, Henry Jackson. Uh, a noted painter as well as photographer. This is Washakie. Washakie was a very good friend of Jim Bridger's. Washakie was of the Shoshone uh, people. Um, he lived a very long, long life. Um, there is some rumors that uh, Bridger's third wife was a Sh Bridger's third wife was a Shoshone woman, um, and she was known as either Little Fawn or Mary. Uh, family tradition is that she was a daughter of Washakie. Um, in my book, I don't say that it's proven to that extent yet. This is a map. It's a little bit unusual to see, um, but I'm going to I want to tell you about how actually it came about. And if I don't find the quote, I'll just uh, do it from memory. This map, and this is written on the back of the map, it's at the American Heritage Center in Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, this map was drawn first by Jim Bridger with a stick drawing in the dirt or sand. Then Bridger drew the map again with charcoal on the hide of an animal. He gave that map then to Colonel William Collins, who wanted to be mapping a considerable part of the West, the Rocky Mountain West, and he uh, undoubtedly stood over his shoulder, Colin's shoulder, while Colin actually did the drawings. And there's a North Platte up at the top, and there's a, a little stream of that called the Bed Tick Creek. Um, Fort Laramie is on the right, and, uh, and Fort Halleck is on the left, and, and this actually shows some of the, not only Bridger's knowledge of the area, um, which is unusual because he was illiterate. He could not read or write, uh, but he could draw it out in the sand. And uh, some of the new um, routes that he that he found. Uh, this is the last image, I believe. No, it's the second to last image. This is called the Hanging of the Chiefs. We're now in 1865. Bridger, when he saw this, um, General Connor and and others, uh, Moonlight, they were hanging uh, 
Indians who had uh, taken white um, hostages and mistreated them. And then they left their bodies there. This is right outside of Fort Laramie. And Bridger predicted this would, this would end horribly for the, uh, for the Americans uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the rage and the outrage of the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho who saw their, uh, their countrymen actually hanging and left there to rot. Uh, this is Red Cloud. It led to Red Cloud's War in 1865 and 1866, one of the few uh, wars that the United States Army lost uh, in the American West. Bridger was opposed to, to this uh, route going through the lands of the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, and he developed a new trail, an alternate trail called the Bridger Trail. And this is an image of Jim Bridger. It's actually a unique, this is the last slide. This is a unique um, way of doing an a, a artistic image. This is taken from a photograph from 1857. William Henry Jackson, the photographer, uh, then blew up a kind of a, on, a, on a stiff mat, uh, and then he charcoaled in uh, like corduroy pants as opposed to uh, the photograph doesn't really indicate what kind of pants he had. So he added detail to this image. This image is at the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, there's a copy of it at the Madison, uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin Historical Society. The Smithsonian has this labeled as Kit Carson question mark. I've advised the, um, the curators there that it is Jim Bridger. And maybe that's when they put the question mark on it. Um, so they have that, I think, in their files there. So I'm going to go out of slideshow and go back to full screen. Uh, we've been talking for 30 minutes already, and I feel like I've just touched the surface. Um, and because Bridger had so many unique characteristics, but I guess the, the third point I want to make, the first point was that Bridger was remarkably active in many, many eras of the American West. The second point was Bridger made a huge impression, a big impact when he met people, and he was so well known uh, people were exhilarated to meet him and they would often write about it, which made my work easier because I could find their journals and their written letters in archives all across the country, uh, from the Smithsonian to the Huntington Library um, and all about. And indeed, um, part of my research was done at the Kansas Public Library um, and the, the historical archive there was very, very helpful in, in doing our, my work on this Bridger biography. The third point I want to make is, and I'll do it briefly, Bridger is someone you would want to meet, and he had uh, admirable character. Um, so, for example, in, 18, in the late 1830s, smallpox was decimating um, the, the Mandans and then the Blackfeet and many other indigenous peoples. And so Bridger was leading a group of brigade, a brigade of trappers and traders, maybe 100 men, um, and they came across, they could see the trail of a Blackfeet village, which was traveling along and they could see some of the dead that were falling and being left behind. Um, so there were people who were traveling with Jim, or, Jim Bridger, but they didn't work directly for him. One of them was Kit Carson. Another one was Joe Meek. Another one was Osborne Russell. All three of them and several others, they wanted to go after and attack this Blackfoot village that was suffering from smallpox. Bridger said no, and he took his, his brigade group away from the path, you know, instead of continuing following the Blackfeet, he was finding a way to go around them. And there was such a, an alarm among these free trappers who did want to attack the uh, suffering Blackfeet uh, because they wanted revenge for uh, previous battles. Um, so, Basically, the free trappers, including Carson and Meek and Osborne Russell and several others, they rode off to do battle with this uh, suffering village. Um, Bridger had all of his men who were under his control to say, we're just staying here. We're not participating in this. Um, and we are, we're going to just protect our, the property that we have and protect our own lives if attacked. So that's an example of a discord, an argument, if you will, between Carson and Bridger. Uh, Carson thought the world of Jim Bridger, uh, but he also was very, could be very impetuous, and Bridger was a little bit more on the, um, the prudent side. Um, 
another incident, a, a big one, in 1862 and 1863, gold was discovered in Idaho and Montana, what's now Idaho and Montana. And this was uh, in the middle of the Civil War. The US government really needed the gold uh, so that they could actually you know, bolster up its treasury because they had so many debts uh, from the Civil War. Um, they wanted, so the, the miners started going right through the territory, the land which had been promised to the Sioux and Arapaho and Cheyenne. Bridget felt that was wrong. And not only that, he felt it was not prudent. It would lead to warfare. There would be Indians killed. There would be soldiers killed. There would be miners killed, families killed. So Bridger, who was well familiar with this area, extremely familiar with both the Bozeman Trail, which was the route that went through the Indian Territory, and then he, he started the Bridger Trail. And that first year, 2,500 of these miners went on the Bridger Trail, and they were safe uh, because they were in the land of the Crow, and they were very, the Crows were very appreciative of Jim Bridger. Uh, only 1,500 went on the Bozeman Trail, and they were relatively safe because of their numbers. There were a couple of people who were killed on that route. The following year, uh, the U.S. Army said, well, we are going to build forts on the Bozeman Trail. So they did not take the Bridger Trail, which uh, I would say is was drier and there wasn't as much forage, but it was significantly safer and it wasn't about to lead to war. They didn't listen to Bridger. Um, and it led to three years of warfare and hundreds of people on both sides uh, being killed. So Bridger had what I would say is generally an admirable character. Um, he wasn't perfect. He didn't strive to be a hero. He never really tried to be a villain. He tried to be helpful when he could. I'm sure he, he did make mistakes and I point those out in the book. Um, but he's a, he's a person, one that had an amazing history too, He's a person that people were amazed and, and honored to meet. And three, he was a person that you can really respect for his values and his beliefs. He didn't generally believe that the others, people who were black, Mexican, uh, Native American, that they were somehow different. I mean, he obviously saw the differences, but he did not treat them nearly as differently as others of his era. So he was ahead of his time in that regard to a major extent. Um, at that point, I think I'll see whether we have any uh, comments or questions. Thank you, Jerry. Excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to open up uh, uh, for audience questions at this time. If, if you have a question for Jerry, uh, just go ahead and put it in the in the comments box and we will uh, get to those. Uh, one I wanted to start out with, you, you referenced the other biographies of Jim Bridger uh, and, and said, you know, they were mostly incomplete. Is there anything that those biographies th that historians have just gotten wrong or overlooked about, about Bridger's life and accomplishments? Well, tremendous. I, I have three pages of, of um, you know, major errors uh, that were that were made. I mean, one, Alter, who actually deserves a lot of credit for writing a book in 1925 that included a lot of information, uh, not only did he talk about Bridger being shy and uh, and uh, kind of unhospitable and, or, or not congenial, um, he suggested that uh, Bridger owned a canoe, and that's what he paddled across the Mississippi River instead of a flatboat. Uh, he suggested that uh, Pierre Chateau, that actually he put this uh, canoe on Henry Andrew Henry's keelboat as it went up the Mississippi River, no justification, or the Missouri River, no justification for that at all. So he was making supposition, but he wasn't really calling it supposition. He was he was uh, just saying this is what happened. Uh, and so, I mean, I think I documented 13 errors in Alter's book in the first chapter. My my point would be if someone wanted to write about about Jim Bridger. Uh, you might get a few ideas from Alter's book in 1962 and Vestal's book in 1946, but it's not to be relied upon in, in really almost any way. I mean, check it with mine and, my, and you know, historians will tell me where I've made my errors as well. And, uh, and that'll, that'll be documented as well. But so much more information is known, you know, and, and, and some of it that I have come across myself and, and that's in the book. That's a nice segue to the to the next question uh, you, you mentioned Bridger 
uh, had his faults. Uh, as a historian, uh, how do you think we should go about balancing accomplishments against uh, any uh, social shortcomings? Well, if by social shortcomings, you mean like the uh, um, going into indigenous people's lands and taking their beaver pelts, et cetera. Um, you know, by, by today's standards, it's not acceptable by any means. Uh, at the time when Lewis and Clark came back from their expedition, 1804 to 1806, they, they reported that there is actually millions of dollars worth of beaver fur that's swimming and scurrying around all these streams in lands that are being contested. Um, and there was a very awkward relationship. Um, the European and American groups and other groups, they would decide among themselves who had rights to this territory to the total um, um, not giving any consideration to, to Indian rights or indigenous people's rights. Um, now the, the US uh, Congress did say that that uh, if they were to take some land from uh, an indigenous tribe, that they needed to actually get their permission and, and provide annuity payments every year, provide uh, other land, provide other things. Often that was done. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, that, that's an instance where he was acting like many others. Um, and the thing is, um, as they went to the Blackfoot territory, the Blackfeet territory, they would find that the Blackfeet are, were very comfortable being uh, armed by the British, the Hudson Bay Company. And so they wanted nothing to do with the American trappers. And in fact, the American trappers wanted to trap those beaver lands, whereas the Hudson Bay wanted to let the Blackfeet trap them and get the money and sell those furs to the Hudson Bay. Um, and so, so that would be a fault, I would say, to Bridger and, and, and um, all of his men who were doing that. Um, on the other hand, their friendship with the Shoshone and the, the Ute and the Flathead, the Nez Perce, the Crows were very helpful. And they, 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 those groups really welcomed that because they needed American guns and bullets and other goods to protect themselves from the Blackfeet. I mean, there was warfare going on between the Blackfeet and all these other uh, Indian groups. You know, you know, Jim Bridger, like a, a lot of the uh, mountain men and kind of iconic figures of the West, were were known to spin a yarn or maybe embellish a story. Um, and then, you know, in, in later, you know, novels and accounts came out of that. Is there a, a favorite fictional account, a, a a story about Jim Bridger that you you find just fascinating? That's it, not maybe not uh, uh, <laughs> true. Well, it, this is definitely not true, um, but it's, well, first of all, Bridger, what, Bridger was one of the first group of people who went into what is now the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, then this was 1826, Bridger was 20, uh, 21, 22 years old, um, he was 22, uh, but he was under William Sublet. And so he would tell people years later, not in the 1920s, but uh, or 1820s, but in the 1830s, 1840s, you tell people about the wonders of Yellowstone and people would not believe them. They wouldn't believe about geysers. They wouldn't believe about obsidian, which was appeared to be glass, black glass. Um, you know, all these things that these thermal regions and the paint pots, um, and they called him always, oh, he's, he's just a big liar. Um, in, in fact, he told, uh, he told many of the, the scientists that he explored with, uh, Captain Reynolds, um, uh, G.K. Warren, who did a tremendous map in the 1850s, uh, Ferdinand Hayden, who discovered uh, the uh, Cretaceous dinosaurs uh, in, in North America. Um, he told all of them, also Stansberry, um, he told them all about these and they accurately recorded what he was saying. But now in terms of tall tales, when Bridger kept getting these um, comments like, oh, that's just a bunch of lies. You're just a big liar. So he did, he did tell, you know, a lot of the people on the, on the, around the campfire told tales anyway. So he had a great one. I won't tell it as well, but it's something along the lines of um, that he was going along and he realized that uh, suddenly he was going to be, he was being chased by, uh, you know, a whole group of, of Indians who were going to kill him. And he raced his horse as fast as he could. And uh, he was getting away from him, but there was one Indian who had a very speedy horse and he stayed right with Bridger the whole time. And the rest of the uh, Indians who were attacking and trying to kill Bridger, they were falling back. 
but Bridger was ahead of this one, uh, this other Indian, or this Indian who was moving forward. And the, suddenly Bridger realized he just approached a cliff and he didn't know what to do. And then he stops his tail. And they said, well, what happened? What happened? And he said, well, the Indian killed me. <laughs> so he would tell stories like that, that they were meant to be funny, not meant to be believed. Um, but he really was based on, uh, on, a, on a lot of true bravery. Um, Bridger was good friends with an um, anthropologist by the name of, of Stevenson. And uh, Stevenson said, you know, for all the stories I heard from Jim Bridger, uh, when I saw it, when I was with him twice, he, we had a very severe encounter with, uh, with American Indians. And when I saw how Bridger calmly and coolly, you know, managed to handle the situation, uh, and made sure that they were averting any fighting um, and or in some cases actually fighting. He said, I can tell you for certain that all of Bridger's stories about his battles, they are all true. Where do you stand on um, when the Bridger was part of the uh, Henry, uh, the Ashley Henry Fur Company expedition, you know, in 1823, you know, they, they mentioned that uh, he was uh, with, uh, you know, stayed back to help uh, Hugh Glass, who uh, um, he was mauled by a bear, you know, uh, and, and uh, in, in presented in the, in the 2000 film, The Revenant. I've, I've read accounts where they, uh, that's purely fictional and others where they think that it, that could have been a young Jim Bridger um, who, who, who stayed with Hugh Glass. Where do you fall on that? I think it could have been Jim Bridger, but I don't think it's proven yet. Um, there are three people who, who knew Bridger very well, and the first three stories about Hugh Glass come from those three people. Just, just not full stories, a full story from uh, uh, Black, Moses Black Harris, and a mention from Potts, and a mention from James Kleiman. Um, it wasn't until 17 years later that Edmund Flagg, who was a writer for the Louisville Literary Newsletter, uh, produced um, a kind of a laughable account uh, there, there are numerous uh, mistakes that he made in there, but he did say that uh, the men who stayed behind, it was the young volunteer, Bridges, and a person named Fitzgerald. Um, and they have identified Fitzgerald. Um, so and I guess this, this is countered by, the reason I'm, I'm somewhat uncertain, one, because the story in the Louisville Literary Newsletter from 1839 is really not very reputable. Um, it, it has them on the long, wrong river. It has it has so many errors, uh, and they're pointed out in the book. But also, this man James Stevenson that I talked about. Uh, there was a, the man in 1886 who was writing a history of Bridger, and he wrote 20 very knowledgeable people, and he asked Stevenson, "What do you know about Hugh Glass and Jim Bridger?" And Stevenson, from the office of the Smithsonian, on a Sunday morning, wrote back in 1886. Yes, Bridger told me about this Hugh Glass episode, but there was no desertion. And there certainly was a desertion, but I take that to mean there was no desertion about Jim Bridger. Jim Bridger was the topic of all the 20 questions that he was asking. And so uh, you've, got, um, you've got this one uh, flag who's writing that it was Bridges, and you've got uh, someone in 1886 who said, Bridger told me about this and said he did not desert. I think the young person who stayed with Glass is a hero. He shouldn't have lied at the end. And Fitzgerald was a, a scoundrel for stealing the rifle and lying about it. This, uh, we had an audience uh, member question. In your research of Bridger, was there another individual you discovered uh, uh, in your research who you, who you think is uh, deserving of a book potentially? Well, there's not really a good full-length book on Andrew Henry, although I know I know someone who's working on one, and and I think he's making very good progress. Um, there, there's there's others as well, um, but Andrew Henry comes to mind certainly as as one uh, who who had a very remarkable life, and there hasn't really been a full-length uh, story on on Henry. Uh, so you know. We're obviously in Kansas City and interested in Bridger's uh, time in Kansas City. Uh, so another audience member asked, um, uh, how did Bridger decide to leave the Rockies and, and, and settle in Kansas City? 
or West Point? I, I think he would not have come back to what we call the settlements or the states um, if he hadn't been. He, he ran afoul of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So there was an altercation or a uh, an ongoing competition, if you will, between Brigham Young and Jim Bridger. Um, and so Brigham Young felt, you know, as I said earlier, I think Bridger is death on us. Um, and uh, and they claimed that uh, that he was selling guns and alcohol to the Ute Indians who were at war in 1853. So Brigham Young, um, well, I should say several people who brought charges against Bridger for selling guns and or alcohol uh, to the Indians. And so there was a, a warrant for his arrest with a charge of treason against the United States. So Bridger didn't really know how to react to that. It, were they, are they just going to give him a slap on the wrist? Are they going to say, you have to leave? Are they going to kill him? Um, and so there was, so he and his uh, wife, his third wife, a Shoshone woman named Mary, uh, and their children, they they uh, went by horse and uh, or maybe wagon uh, to Kansas City. Vasquez, his partner, had already established a home in uh, in the Westport area, and Bridger uh, did bought a, bought a home, I think, uh, in 1850 or bought the the Thatcher farm in 1855. In 1853, this is when when Bridger felt he better get out of Fort Bridger uh, for fear of his life. In 1854, he went to Washington, D.C., and he talked to uh, members of Congress and felt, uh, gave his view that uh, the fort had been taken from him against his will. Uh, Brigham Young was furious at this and said that uh, uh, if Bridger were to come back and try to disobey the rules of this territory the way he'd done before, he will find himself being hung up between heaven and earth. He also said, wrote, uh, not to members of Congress, but to his own delegate, Bernheisel, in Washington, D.C. If members of Congress think that Jim Bridger is the oracle of all things West, we should just tell them, meaning Congress, that they can kiss my ass, damn you. Now, that's, a, that's in the letter, and it's crossed out. Now, Brigham Young was very frank, um, and he could be very, uh, very earthy in his language. Uh, he was a tremendous leader, uh, and he, he, you know, was a very, very successful leader for his people. But obviously, they, they were not getting along, and uh, Brigham Young was very aggravated. The reason why is because after Bridger went to Washington, D.C., um, the uh, Douglas, who was the senator who was running the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, or bill, actually was considering reducing the, the boundary belonging to Utah Territory and increasing Nebraska Territory basically cutting out Fort Bridger and the Green River Ferries and keeping them part of Nebraska instead of giving them to Utah. And that's where all the money was, uh, the Green River Ferries, which Bridger operated, as well as Bridger's Fort, which uh, Bridger operated. And they, they were the first ones to get the money before the, uh, the Saints, uh, in this tremendous explosion of immigration, you know, came to Salt Lake City. We have a looks like one final audience question. It's a good one to wrap up wrap up wrap up uh, the segment. Um, we, they were they were curious how the book tour is going. You know, it's different. Uh, you know, different type of tour with uh, Zoom presentations, online presentations. Maybe not a traditional uh, book tour. Um, where will you be speaking next? Where can people get the book? Well, this is my fourth of five online events. I'm doing one Wednesday. Um, well, well, you have a, probably a book, a local bookstore that you'd like to suggest they could get a book. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, Rainy Day Books in Kansas City would be a good one. But um, of course, look yeah. forward at your favorite bookstore. Yeah, do that. Um, so um, on Wednesday, I'm speaking um, virtually uh, from Boswell Books in Milwaukee. And that's in conversation with Doug Brinkley, who's a friend of mine, but he happens to be chief historian for the CNN. And, and we've talked back and forth about this book and other books. Uh, so I'm delighted that Wednesday night, uh, that'll be Boswell Books in Milwaukee. And now I'm planning a tour and I have four stops already lined up um, in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and Gillette, Wyoming, Pinedale, Wyoming, and um, Casper, Wyoming. And this is in the period, and this will be in person, 
uh, in the, the uh, range of July, uh, maybe 7th or 8th to July 14th. And then I also intend to be at the Fort Bridger Rendezvous on Saturday, I believe it's a September 4th of that weekend. And I'm looking for more in-person uh, talks because I love to talk about Bridger and I love to meet uh, readers face to face. Well, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. And of course, uh, Jerry Insler for, uh, for, for just an excellent presentation. I encourage everyone to go out and pick up a copy of the book and, uh, and make sure to go to the library's website to uh, see some of the upcoming uh, programs we have for the remainder of this month into the summer. Jerry, thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure.